You know, in life, you always hear the message that you can do anything you want to do. I must say, I, I don't actually subscribe to that line of thinking. See, I believe that God equipped every person with a natural skill set, which means some people are just going to be better at certain things than other people are going to be. And it's not just a matter of putting your mind to it. It's about kind of being made for it. And I believe that because as I travel through life, I often come across people that I definitely wouldn't pick to do certain things because they just weren't made for it. And if you th think just anybody is going to do, you know, just you can do it if you want to put your mind to it. If you think that's going to do, that's going to lead you to pick the wrong person for the wrong job. Yeah. For example, this is the wrong dog for a watchdog. that dog this is the wrong choice for your tug of war team how can you mess up tug of war this is the wrong girl for your obstacle course <laughs> <laughs> this is the wrong donkey to try and tame. Yep, this is the wrong EMS to call when you need help. <laughs> I think that woman just said in Spanish that he squished his tomato. Is that, is that what she said? <laughs> That's what I hear. I hear he squished his tomato. I, I guess my point in showing you all of these things is so that you understand there is a right person and there is a wrong person for every job. And if I'm being honest, I'm not completely convinced that Moses was actually the best choice for this particular job that God had planned out for him to do. Why do I say this? Well, last week we saw Moses speaking to the burning bush and we learned that this miracle of the burning bush was a way of God showing his glory, but also his desire to protect his children and not to harm them. So today we're going to take a look at Moses' response to this miracle. Now, I want you to remember that right now, Moses is at this moment in time speaking to a bush which is on fire but does not burn up. And the voice coming from within this miraculous bush is the author of all creation, the Most High God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Just to put you in a mindset of what is taking place here. Now, with that in mind, let's look at Exodus 3.10. Here's what uh, God says. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And Moses' response is, verse 11, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? <laughs> Are you serious? Moses is kneeling before a burning bush from which God himself is speaking to him out of. God tells him to do something, and his response to this face-to-face -face encounter with God is, I don't want to do it. Is this guy nuts? Like, seriously, is he nuts? Is God sure that he picked the right guy for this job? I mean, wouldn't a guy who would be a little bit more willing than this be a better choice, a better candidate? So God responds to him, don't worry, Moses, I'll be with you. I'll be with you. But that's not enough for Moses. You see, Moses objects again and gives excuses four more times. Four more times. And each time, God 
patiently reassures him. Well, kind of till the last. But basically what Moses says to God, his objections are, I don't know enough. People wouldn't take me seriously. I'm not good with words. And then the last time, he just flat out refuses. He's like, nah, I don't think so. And does Moses have a point? I mean, he doesn't sound like a good candidate for the job. You know what I'm saying? Why in the world would God pick someone like this to be his servant to deliver his people? Well, first of all, we are introduced to Moses as an adult through two stories. Two stories. In the first one, he saves a Hebrew from death. In the second one, he saves seven daughters from some rowdy shepherds. Now, traditionally, when scripture introduces you to someone through a story, so when the first time you get to meet them is through a story, that story is put there to help you understand their defining characteristics. These stories are telling you that Moses is a good man who desires to save others. That's why those stories are there, because they're trying to help you get an understanding of what Moses' character is really like. And we also learn some other things from uh, other scripture about Moses, like in Numbers 12.3. It tells us, now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Well, I feel like that's a pretty good compliment. Yes. So when you look at the stories and look at the setup, it's really less likely that he's underqualified and more likely that he's being humble to a fault. And this idea is further solidified when you read what Luke has to say about him in Acts chapter 7. Listen to Acts 7, 20 through 22. At that time, Moses was born, and he was no ordinary child. For three months, he was cared for by his family. When he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own son. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. Yeah, see, Moses is qualified to speak on God's behalf. It really wasn't skill that he was lacking. That's, that's not what we get out of Scripture. What was he lacking? He was lacking the willingness to sacrifice. I mean, don't get me wrong. This is no easy task that is set before him. It, it is not. But he's got to stop making lame excuses because there's only so much of this that God will take. And at, 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 when the fifth objection comes around, he just comes right out and says it. He says it in verse 13. But Moses said, Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. You see, it really wasn't about his ability. It was about his desire. Moses was comfortable. And this, well, this was going to require much sacrifice. We're always good at making sacrifices, in theory. Just not in practice. We are very willing to give up other people's things for them. But we hold on to our own things with a death grip. I mean, think about it. What are you willing to sacrifice to God if he were to ask of it from you? How quickly would you agree to changing jobs, moving hundreds of miles away, giving up your retirement, spending months on the road, putting your life in danger, leading people who hurt you? and aren't very good listeners at following direction. I mean, it's easy to critique Moses, but I can't say that I wouldn't do the same thing, or frankly, haven't done the same thing for that matter. Well, God had enough of Moses' excuses. You had to know that this was coming. Exodus 4, 14. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He's already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him, put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak, and I will teach you what to do. You see, Moses was making all of these excuses, but God already had it all worked out. He'd already even sent Aaron on his way before Moses even asked for it. God's pretty cool like that. Well, Moses reluctantly agrees and packs up his wife and kids, and then he hits the road. And it isn't long into this trip before we experience our first rough moment. And now I'm going to give you a heads up. Listen to me. We are about to come to the most 
crazy and awkward part of this story. You hear me? It is crazy and awkward. Let me read you Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 through 26, while the cat runs through my yard. Exodus 4, 24 through 26. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zephorah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. I told you. I told you. Now, I will tell you that as a pastor, I am always tempted to pretend like verses like these don't exist in the Bible. It would be a whole lot easier just to kind of skate right on past. There's so much to talk about in this story that I could have skipped right by and pretend like I didn't even notice it. Oh, what did it say? I never even read that. I don't know what it's talking about. I have no idea. Which certainly would have made this moment much less awkward. But I don't actually enjoy glossing over difficult sections in Scripture because... All scripture is important. It is there for a reason. And this section actually makes a lot of sense when you stop and take a moment to think about it. You see, in Genesis chapter 17, verse 9 through 14, God says this. Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep, Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between you and me. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. You see, back when God was establishing his nation being that of the offspring of Abraham, he gave them a very specific command of how to mark themselves being his children. This is, was to set them apart from other nations. Circumcision was what was setting them apart, and that was his command. Now Moses was chosen by God to set his own people free, yet his very own son, he had refused to do what was asked of him to make his son a part of the Hebrew nation. Clearly, this was a willful choice of Moses because although this is the one and only time that we read about it in this story, clearly the fact that God is about to kill him shows that this isn't the first time that this topic is addressed. It also becomes obvious who was responsible for the refusal to have the child circumcised. I mean, when you put this story in context and start to play it through, uh, Moses' wife, Zephora, does the circumcision. And then what does she do? Well, she basically throws it then at his feet and calls him a bridegroom of blood. This was not a happy lady, was it? No. Generally, I'm guessing that bridegroom of blood is not a compliment. And here's where the real problem lies. There's the cat again, yes. Moses has chosen his wife's wishes over God's. And that's what took place. And what many people don't understand is that anything you place before God is considered a form of idolatry. And that even goes for your spouse. That even goes for your kids. Exodus 22. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Deuteronomy 6.5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And once you have accepted God as your father, your life is supposed to become a pyramid. And if you get anything out of order in this pyramid, then life can quickly fall completely out of order for the rest of it. And I'll just mention here real quickly, if you look at that pyramid, spouse is also above children. Yeah, that's the way it's supposed to be, folks. If you're living in a marriage where your children come before your spouse, then you got some fixing to do because you are out of order. But that's a sermon for another day. You see, at the top of every Christian's pyramid, God should come first. 
And if you flip this out of order, if you put something before him, then that thing is called an idol. Now, I'm not telling you that you are supposed to ignore the people that you love. I'm not telling you that if your house is on fire and there's only thing you can carry, only one thing you can carry out, and you have to choose between your Bible and your baby, you pick your Bible. That's not what I'm saying. Absolutely not. I'm not telling you that you should neglect your family to spend extra time with God. But I am telling you that God says one thing. And if he says one thing and your spouse says another, and then you pick your spouse over God, that's called idolatry. And you have an idol. And what people don't understand is if we were people who truly put God first in our relationships with our, our wives or husbands and children, if you continually put his desires and wishes first, you will become the best husband you could possibly be. You will be a better father than you could ever have imagined. But if instead you put him second, third, fourth, if you continually choose your child's hectic schedule over God's schedule, if you continually choose the wishes of your spouse over the wishes of God, then you have idols. And you're performing idolatry. That's what the Bible says. God says to Moses, circumcise your son, Zephora said. Mm, I don't think so. Moses says, whatever you say, honey. Yep, yep. Happy life, happy life. And you got your pyramid out of order. Moses chose an idol, and God expected more out of the leader of Israel. And he was making it clear that to be a part of this family, it would require sacrifice. God is willing to sacrifice, and he asks us to do the same in return. You got to get your pyramid in order. You know, at some point in time, we're not exactly sure when, but Moses sends his family back to stay with his father-in-law for a while until they are reunited after the Hebrews are freed. And this chapter seems to end on a high note. Exodus 4.29, Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. And when they heard the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. So God had equipped Moses with a staff that would turn into a snake, a hand that would become leprous on command and the ability to turn water into blood. And the people, they like what they see um, from Moses and hear from Aaron. And they bow down and they worship Yahweh. As always, though, seems like the story has a way of kind of turning up upside down on its head pretty quickly, doesn't it? And that's exactly what we'll see when Moses and Aaron meet up with Pharaoh next Sunday. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. God bless. Hope to see you soon.